Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Lent. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Russell Pollitt. Rejoice, Jerusalem, and all who love her. Be joyful, all who were in mourning. Exult and be satisfied at her consoling breast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Welcome as we come together to celebrate this fourth Sunday of Lent, or Laudete, Rejoicing Sunday. We welcome most especially those who join us on this broadcast. There may not be much to rejoice about in our world, yet today the Church celebrates as we get closer and closer to the Easter mysteries. And so as we begin the celebration, let's bring before the Lord our anxiety and our sinfulness, and yet to know that God offers us consolation, and therefore we can rejoice. I confess to Almighty, Almighty God, God, and, and to you, my, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned, sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten towards the solemn celebrations to come. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of Samuel. In those days, the Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on, he, on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these, and Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. 
and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The responsorial psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my shepherd. shepherd. There, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me. He revives my soul. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He guides me along the right path. For the sake of his name, though I should walk in the valley of the shadow of death, no evil would I fear, for you are with me. Your crook and your staff will give me comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a table before me. In the sight of my foes, my head you have anointed with oil. My cup is overflowing. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house, I shall dwell for the length of days unending. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Friends, once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. I am the light of the world, says the Lord. He who follows me will have the light of life. Glory, Glory and, and praise to you, O Christ. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. 
As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was division among them. So they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and we know that he was born blind, but how he sees now we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be Christ, he has to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you too want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world begun has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, 
and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The physically blind rarely see, and those with physical sight are blind. That is what it seems to me is at the core of the account we have just heard. In this difficult and challenging time in our world and in the church, the account of the blind man, it seems, offers us lessons on how we can face the place we find ourselves in. I want to suggest, friends, that there are three things we can reflect on this fourth Sunday of Lent, this Rejoicing Sunday. The first one is something about our religious structures. The second, sickness. And the third, sight and seeing are not necessarily the same thing. Let's look a little bit at religious structures. The Jewish religious authorities, the Pharisees, have a way of being in the world, of dealing with the world, of coping with the world. They have set up religious structures that have become the be-all and the end-all. Their religious system is no longer about faith, nourishment, and growth but about their own ideology. Religious structure has become a trap that they have fallen into. They do not use it, as Jesus points out to us in Matthew's Gospel, to lift people's burdens. Instead, they weigh people down with burdens. There is no flexibility. The burdened blind man has broken the law according to them. They do not rejoice that his burden is lifted. They condemn him. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, shows us that religious structures are there to help and facilitate growth, for us to become the people that God wants us to be. They are not there to burden us. Sometimes we too can adopt that Pharisaic view. We can use our good religious structures to lay burdens on others for the sake of our own ends and not God's. We too can be inflexible and condemning. In these days when the world faces the challenge of the coronavirus, our religious structures are being asked to be flexible for the greater good, for the common good. We're being asked not to be a burden, but to set free and help each other see our faith and our lifestyles in a different way. We are being given new sight so that we can see differently, approach our day-to-day -day lives in a different way, and hopefully live out our faith in all spheres in a way that is in accordance with these times. The second thing we might want to reflect on is sickness. How often don't we hear the fundamentalist claim that sickness or disaster is a manifestation of God's will, punishment for sin. We do this over and over. Just this last week, as the world became a changing and challenging place, some religious authorities offered this explanation. The coronavirus is a punishment from God. We've heard this before. AIDS was deemed a punishment from God. Japan's earthquake as a punishment for not being Christian. How many times don't we hear 
and perhaps are even tempted to think ourselves that God is a punishing God. Jesus rejects this in today's gospel. It's a false and dangerous image of God. Right from the start, Jesus tells his disciples that they are asking the wrong question. Stop looking for someone to blame, he says. There is no cause and effect here. Look instead for what it is that God can do. He tells them that they need to be at work, rather, for the one who sent them. He shows how this is done when he reaches out to this blind man. And so Jesus today assures us that sickness and disaster is not about punishment. Rather, it is a moment in which God's care and compassion is revealed to all those who suffer. The real problem is that we don't like living in the gray. We want things to be black and white. And perhaps Jesus teaches us today that God often works in the gray. God is comfortable in what seems to be the gray areas of our lives. Jesus reminds us that sickness and disaster are transitory. He reminds us that we are to show the same care and compassion as he did. The sickness and sufferings of others is an opportunity for us to live our Christian vocation, to be truly human. And we do this in many different ways. By praying for the sick, supporting their families, reaching out where appropriate. At this time, our Christian witness is also to respond to what we have been asked to do by the church, by health authorities, and by governments for the common good, and indeed, for the healing of all. And finally, there's a difference between sight and seeing. They are not the same. In this account, we hear Jesus doesn't heal the man, but he sends him to the pool. This tells us a few things. Firstly, that healing is a process. We are often duped into believing that healing should be instantaneous. Throughout the scriptures, we discover healing is a process. Notice how the blind man is willing to do his part. Although blind, he sees more clearly than those around him. He cooperates with Jesus. We too have to cooperate with God. The blind man wouldn't see if he didn't go and wash in the pool. God's grace and the man's response work together to bring about his healing. He sees what all those who have sight cannot see. As the account develops, we see how he sees what others cannot. Notice how he calls Jesus a man named Jesus. Then further on, a prophet. And then further on, the Son of Man. He begins to see what nobody else is able to see. Contrast the man with his parents in the story. It's curious that they refuse to accept the consequences of their knowledge, that unlike their son, they choose not to see. They are afraid to see more clearly and witness what they have seen because they are intimidated. Do we cooperate with God's grace, which is given to us in many different ways? Are we, like the blind man, willing to see more deeply, allow God to work in ways which we might not expect or even thought possible? In an era of rights and entitlement, we often fight for what we think we have a right to or we are entitled to. We could approach our faith like this too. God is not giving me what I want or what I am entitled to. At this time, when the world around us is unsure and rapidly changing, as social distancing and isolation become ways of survival, as life becomes more cumbersome and even difficult to negotiate, we could be wondering what we are losing. 
worried about what we think our rights should be and what we're entitled to. If we pause, God might be saying something very different to us. We hear today in that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and therefore I shall not want. Is God asking us to see anew from where we are now, to cooperate with God's abundant grace, which never leaves us, to notice how God is forming us anew and giving us deeper insight as he did for the blind man? On this rejoicing Sunday, it may feel like there is little to rejoice about. Yet, if we, like the blind man, come to Jesus, we too will see things in a new way and rejoice that God is surely at work right here, right now. Let's pray today for the gift of seeing all things anew. And so we make a profession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We have heard God's word spoken to us, and so now we come before our God with our own needs and our intentions. For the church, that we may share the light of the gospel with all who are struggling to recognize good from evil, truth from lies, and selfless love from self-preserving or self-serving activity. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. hear us. For all who have no sight or who lo are losing their sight, that they may experience God's presence with them and God's guidance in living their lives fully. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. hear us. For all who have suffered abuse by religious leaders, that God will heal their wounds, give them new insight into their strengths, and help them to be open to sharing their gifts for the good of others. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear, hear us. For all who are bound by the blindness of prejudice, that God will free them from judging others and open their eyes to the value and dignity of each human person. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear, hear us. For government officials at this time, that God will anoint their minds and hearts so that they may promote the well-being of all whom they serve, particularly the vulnerable and powerless of society, as they make difficult decisions to fight against the coronavirus. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. 
for all who are ill, particularly those with the coronavirus, that God will heal them and restore them to their families and communities. We pray too for all who work in healthcare, that God will give wisdom to those working to contain the virus, insight to those searching for treatments or a vaccine, and strength to those caring for the sick. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our own intentions, in a moment of silence, we bring our own intentions to the Lord, wherever we may be. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty God, we offer you these, our prayers, those we speak out, but the prayer too in the heart of each one of us. Answer them as you know best, through Christ Jesus, your Son, and our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer, fruit of the earth and work of our human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of our human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Yes, blessed, blessed be God, God forever. Let's pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. We place before you with joy these offerings, which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both fruitfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right, right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. By the mystery of the Incarnation, he has led the human race that walked in darkness into the radiance of the faith and has brought those born in slavery to ancient sin through the waters of regeneration to make them your adopted children. Therefore, all creatures of heaven and earth sing a new song in adoration, and we, with all the hosts of angels, cry out, without end, as together we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord, Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, 
the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving you thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more, giving thanks, he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Bhuti, our Bishop, Duncan, his assistant, and all the clergy and all who minister to your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Formed by divine teaching, and at the Lord's command, we now dare to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and with, with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take, take away the sins of the world. Have, have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Although you cannot receive physical communion with us now, we invite you into a moment of spiritual communion. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, defines spiritual communion as an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Sacrament and a loving embrace as though we had already received him. His words are echoed by the great mystic and fellow doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, When you do not receive communion and do not attend Mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. At this moment, we invite you to focus on Christ and your longing for union with Him. Express your desire to feel His grace coursing through you, giving you strength and courage, particularly in these difficult times. In your desiring union, you are united with us and to Christ. In this moment, we experience the reality that is already here. The Lord anointed my eyes. I went, I washed, I saw, and I believed in God. Let us pray. O God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts, we pray with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty and love you in all sincerity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your spirit. spirit. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak, Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death and bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go now in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.